So what about child welfare involvement? Uh, well, you've got a lot of it. Um, and uh, we have some data on the basis of self-reports in the full sample, national sample, and child protective service records in Alameda County. And as I said before, the self-reports show that most of those, those separations are informal, not ever known to child protective services. Uh, they have to do with hardship. Uh, they sometimes have to do with inability to parent, to either the parent's satisfaction or to her relative's satisfaction, and they can, can move in. Uh, and Child Protective Services may never find out about it. Okay, what about the child welfare records? Well, uh, if there is a child welfare report, uh, a potential abuse and neglect from a mandated reporter or another reporter, four things can happen. Uh, first, the CPS worker conducts a safety assessment and may decide to close the case without an in-person investigation. That's called evaluated out. Uh, or uh, they can conduct an investigation and they can say it's unfounded, it's inconclusive, we're not sure, or it's substantiated. We really have believe, reason to believe that there is abuse or neglect here, okay? Uh, and so this um, is uh, information about the results of child welfare reports for families in the shelter. And let's walk through it a little slowly because it, it's complicated, okay? So you see that uh, red box over entry uh, in the middle and there's a, a vertical line there. That's the point at which families entered into the study, okay? So that was the beginning of a shelter episode for them. And then going back to the left, we have 90-day periods. Each bar is a 90-day period and we go back for about six and a half years. And going forward on the right, each, day, each bar is a 90-day period, and we have about three years going forward from the time of shelter entry. Okay, you with me? Um, and the color of the bars shows, well, the height of the bars is how many families. The color shows the most serious outcome for that family in that period. So if a family had both a substantiated case and an evaluated out case, we'd call it substantiated in that period. The light colored bars, uh, sort of pale pink there, uh, are uh, evaluated out. So the Child Protective Service worker didn't even think it was necessary to do an in-person evaluation on the basis of that uh, report. The, pink, the slightly darker pink ones are uh, the ones that were unfounded, so there was an investigation, but uh, the decision was that there was not evidence. The brighter red there are inconclusive, that's a small number, and the darker uh, red, almost black, black uh, here, uh, are the substantiated cases. Okay, so clear what's up there. So now let's, let's think about it. Um, the most uh, striking thing is that reports go way up after study entry and that most of those reports are evaluated out or unsubstantiated. Okay, most of them are those light colors, uh, the very pale evaluated out, the, the uh, pink unsubstantiated. Okay, we also see a little bit of an increase uh, particularly of evaluated out, not substantiated before people come into shelter. So there's a more modest uh, increase there. So why do you think we have this huge spike afterwards? Why when families come into shelter do people start reporting them for child abuse and neglect? Thoughts? They're mandated reporters, They're mandated reporters. okay. Most of the reports aren't coming from folks who work for the homeless service system, but uh, and, and the mandated reporters have to see something, right? They don't just report somebody because... Yeah? Neighbors and family, neighbors and friends that are worried about the family because they've lost their housing and they call the child Okay. Yeah? They see it as a way to connect the family. Well, that's interesting. Now, these are all families who are in shelters at the point or, or have been. I mean, in the first 90 days, they certainly have a period in shelter and afterwards. Okay, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So the trauma of being homeless 
uh, says that you know that the stress of uh, being homeless may affect your parenting and uh, there may be behavior that really is uh, problematic there and uh, some of the other explanations go more to the visibility of families so that we we see them they're mandated reporters we you know we see them when we might not have seen them otherwise um, and the fact that so many of these cases are evaluated out or unsubstantiated uh, suggests to me that a lot of it is that that visibility uh, but that's some of the stuff that you'll you'll want to talk about more the, this afternoon um, why do you think the reports go up before people come into shelter Yeah, I, that, that's pretty much the way I think about it, too, though. Are there other I ideas? I'll elaborate on that one in a minute. Yeah? Sometimes people view a uh, family becoming homeless as a uh, neglect, something neglectful that the parents are doing or somewhere that the parents are failing by not being able to maintain mm -hmm. housing or keep a little kid housing. They view the parents um, in a negative way that also allows them to be the parents as negative as not Yeah, and in California as elsewhere, being homeless is not evidence of abuse or neglect, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean the world doesn't see it that way. Uh-huh, yeah. So um, going back to the notion that uh, you know, there, there are a lot of stressors that families are going through before they come to shelter. Going to shelter is not the first thing you do. Uh, you know, none of us would, uh, because a new shelter opened up down the block, go and avail ourselves of those, those services. People try very hard to stay out of shelter. And they're doing all kinds of things to, to try to avoid that. Uh, but they may be moving around a lot. They may be experiencing a lot of hardship. The kids may be falling asleep in school or uh, they may be hungry. Uh, and so uh, we may be seeing the tremors before the earthquake, right? And uh, so that might be a period for prevention and early intervention. That is, at the point when that call comes in, if, as uh, Nan talked about, there were two questions like the VA is asking of every family that's evaluated for uh, a protective service involvement, and if it looked like there was a housing uh, situation that was contributing to whatever the issues are, even if it's evaluated out, even if it's not, not an issue, or especially if it's evaluated out, if it looks like housing is a piece of that, could that then coordinate with the homeless assistance system? Could that be a way of uh, thinking about prevention? Yeah. So um, here's the data again leading up to the first shelter uh, entry, um, I'm sorry, the study shelter entry. No, take it back again, first shelter entry. So in, in these um, HMIS mem measures, we have all the entries over a long period of time, and so we can look at the first shelter entry that we have for a family, and that's what these data are from. Later, we'll just talk about the shelter entry associated with the study. So this is the first shelter entry, and this is only the pre part, but what's different from the last graph is that we only show the episode that's closest to shelter entry, the one that came closest to the time families came into shelter. And again, we see that upswing in reports prior to uh, shelter entry. And here's the after data, uh, again, giving only the episode that is closest to the time of shelter entry, but this time afterwards. And again, we see that, that huge spike of unfounded and unsubstantiated cases after folks come into shelter. Okay. Um, then, okay. uh, let's go on to uh, the percentage of families with any report 
to child welfare at any time uh, over the period that we've got data with any investigation, so the investigations are a subset of any report, with any substantiated report, again a subset, with any foster care placement, that's not necessarily a subset. You could have a foster care placement, for example, if a family uh, a caregiver was incapacitated or went into prison without ever having a report of child abuse and neglect, you might have foster care uh, take custody of, of a child. Uh, and we see that the likelihood of all of these child protective outcomes goes up with the number of shelter episodes that families experience. So the more shelter episodes, the higher risk of the family getting involved with child protective services. Okay. So now let's look at predictors of child welfare outcomes after study entry. So now we're, we're focusing on the uh, families at the point that they entered the study and what happened to them afterwards. Okay? And first let's look at just reports of abuse and neglect. And what we see is that a key predictor of being reported after shelter entry was having been reported prior to shelter entry, okay? Past behavior, future behavior, that's not very surprising. Uh, the association of Cal works with uh, reports may be a chicken and the egg issue. That is, uh, Child Protective Services works hard to hook people up with Cal works. And so, uh, and we don't have, um, our, our data aren't good enough to allow us to say which one came first, just whether they're after shelter entry or if they're in a particular year. Prior shelter episode, okay? We've seen lots of evidence now that shelter episodes are associated with child welfare reports. Um, lack of work uh, prior to shelter entry, again, not surprising. It's associated with repeat homelessness. It's associated with more uh, child welfare reports. Um, the most disturbing finding here is that non-white race matters. So, uh, and that's predominantly African American, not entirely. We don't have large enough groups of everybody else to really pull people apart uh, very well in Alameda. Uh, so it's true that non-white families have less income and less wealth on average than white families, so that they end up in shelter more often. Uh, but all of our families experienced homelessness. So among the families who've been in shelter, the non-white families were more likely to be reported to child welfare agencies. Um, and that was particularly true for families that had never had a prior report. So we had 135 non-white families that had never had a prior report, 40 of them got reported after shelter entry. We had 19 white families that had never had a prior report, zero of them got reported after shelter entry. And as we've seen, most of those reports were evaluated out or unsubstantiated. Um, so when we look for substantiated abuse and neglect, we don't have any predictors. So race is not predicting to substantiation of reports, it's predicting, I'm sorry, there we go. Uh, it's predicting to, to the, the reports, okay? Um, so any bias in the system isn't the child welfare worker who's doing the substantiation, right? They're not showing any differences uh, by race. Uh, it's having to do with the, the reports prior to that time. Uh, and some of those reports are coming from the shelter system. Most of them are not. Um, we do from qualitative data, we did a qualitative study of 80 families across four sites. A quarter of them were in Alameda County more than a quarter of the families that in the qualitative study, so at least some from Alameda County, said that uh, shelter staff threatened them with child protective service reports to try to induce uh, various uh, sorts of, of behavior. And I'm sure that the, the shelter staff um, and to some extent transitional housing staff are trying to get parents to uh, parent appropriately. Uh, but the parents are feeling like uh, the uh, service system is um, threatening them with involvement in, in child protective services. Um, so some, something to consider. And then for foster care placement, uh, again, no issue of race. Uh, and uh, the only predictor we have there is foster care placement prior to study entry. Okay. So these are all controlling for the intervention you're in because we know that the subsidy intervention reduces the foster care placements. Okay, 
so those are the findings. What have we learned um, out of this? Uh, what have we learned uh, first about the intersections among the systems in Alameda County? Uh, well, there's substantial overlap between child welfare and homeless service systems. The child welfare reports, uh, and, and that's true everywhere. Um, Non-white families are at special risk for reports, but not for substantiated reports, so the bias doesn't seem to be in the child welfare system. Um, it's not as clear where differential reporting originates. Um, and uh, I've said that there, there are issues with families feeling threatened by shelter providers. Um, avoiding shelter stays would make families less vulnerable to unnecessary reports. So among the traumas that families go through with, with reports, I'm not sure they're traumatized if they're evaluated out, uh, but they're certainly traumatized if there's uh, an investigation because there's nothing really scarier to a family uh, than the possibility of, of losing access to one of their children. So that's yet another reason to end homelessness, if we didn't have ones beforehand, would be to uh, try to avoid unnecessary reports. Okay. Um, more lessons about uh, service systems in Alameda County. We have this more modest increase in non-substantiated child welfare reports before families enter shelter. Might this be an early warning system for homelessness? Uh, could the child welfare workers regularly investigate ha families' homeless circumstances or housing circumstances in the same way that the VA ha has taken it upon itself to say, any report, let's, let's look at housing. Uh, many families are not fully using uh, their benefits uh, prior to coming into shelter. Might hooking families up with benefits, uh, more families uh, be helpful in averting some, some homelessness. Okay. Uh, thinking not only about Alameda County, but kind of across the board, uh, the homeless service system's gotten better at serving full families, but it's not good enough. So we still had, across the board and in Alameda County, just over 10% of families with a spouse or partner living elsewhere when they were first in shelter. And uh, based on the qualitative data, which is a small sample, uh, more than half of those had to do with shelter rules, the shelter ability to accommodate full families. Um, and uh, we're, we did not have a lot of uh, kids who were separated from their uh, parents because of shelter rules. We've gotten really much better at teenage boys and, and the like, but we're still not terribly good about spouses, about three generational families, about adult children. Um, so, some shelters manage to do that, others, others do not. Uh, programs screen out a lot of families, and surprisingly, the programs that are part of the homeless service system uh, screen out more families than the housing subsidies uh, do, than the housing authorities do. So uh, the, part, the programs that are supposed to serve homeless people, um, and this was certainly true in Alameda County, and it was especially true actually of rapid rehousing in Alameda County, are less willing to serve the families who are homeless or the families are less willing to go to them and we can't always tell the difference there. Uh, and uh, families, even pretty desperate families who've been in shelter for a week will turn down programs that they don't think are gonna be helpful to them. So that means that uh, for continue, you know, if you're trying to do coordinated entry, um, you need to have a plan B for families. I mean, it may be uh, because of a capacity issue uh, or it may be because of program requirements. Programs certainly reasonably try to find the families they think they can help, um, but uh, a lot of families, you know, if a lot of families can't fit into some part of your system, they've got to fit in somewhere else or they're just not going to get served. Um, Okay, the remaining findings come really from the national study, but they're likely to apply here. Uh, so with usual care, no special offer, but lots of services, you know, $30,000 worth of services that people were using over the course of, of 20 months. Um, families spent, uh, on average, about four months in emergency shelter following random assignment. As emergency shelter has very high levels of uh, s services, case management, case management ratios are usually higher than in, in transitional housing. Uh, and uh, despite those high costs, uh, many were not faring well. Some families were doing great, 
Uh, many of them had disappeared from the homeless service system, not all of them, but a lot of them were doubled up and a lot of them were suffering in, in some other ways. Uh, transitional housing uh, screened out the largest proportion of families and the take up was the lowest of the other interventions. Uh, so it may well be a useful intervention for some families, but again, you need a plan B because an awful lot of families get left out. Uh, priority offers reduced homelessness compared to usual care over 20 months, not over uh, 30 months in the Alameda data. Uh, benefits did not extend to, to other outcomes. So what's going on in the shelters works about the same. Um, and surprisingly, they weren't more effective for families with high psychosocial needs. Uh, the goal of transitional housing is to address family barriers that make housing stability difficult by providing social services, and we don't see a lot of evidence that that was achieved. Uh, and transitional housing is the most costly of the interventions. Rapid rehousing, altogether about, only about 60% of the families who were offered rapid rehousing ended up using it, partly because of the programs, partly because of the families. Uh, and so take up was surprisingly low, we thought. Um, families were given referrals to specific programs that had reserved spaces for them, uh, but nonetheless, two-fifths did not find their way in. Uh, folks who were offered rapid rehousing left shelter about half a month faster than families uh, offered, not offered anything special. That was true also for folks offered transitional housing uh, or housing subsidies. Folks who actually got into rapid rehousing did leave. Uh, more rapidly, and folks who got into transitional housing left pretty rapidly because there was a space right there for them. Uh, priority access to rapid rehousing had scattered effects on some other outcomes, most notably, and this is important, increasing incomes and food security and reducing school absences. And it may well be that that increased uh, income over the longer term will turn into you know, greater increases in income and will help families really get to self-sufficiency. Um, so uh, a big selling point for rapid rehousing is costs. So overall it had somewhat better outcomes than usual care um, at about 10% lower cost um, for the folks who were offered it, at substantially lower folks for the cost for the folks who actually used it. Um, and that allows you to uh, spread your resources uh, more, more, more broadly. Uh, subsidies. Uh, some of the ideas here were not so surprising. Uh, you give people housing subsidies, duh, they stop being homeless. Um, and we see the reductions in your HMIS records and the reductions in your records go beyond the uh, records in, in the study. Uh, more problematically, uh, the reduced labor par uh, market engagement um, is, is an issue. It's certainly an issue for policy providers. In some other studies have also found that and found that that uh, reduced engagement dissipates over five years. Uh, I'm not sure people are willing to wait that long. Um, so uh, then there were some much more surprising findings out of the study, we thought. Uh, first, that most families who are eligible for housing were eligible for housing subsidies, and 84% of those who were offered them used them in a variety of housing markets. And in you know one of the tightest housing markets in the study, you, uh, we got even more than 90% using them. So um, it's uh, you know I'm not sure what help people were getting in finding units, but they managed. Um, costs over 20 months were comparable to usual care. Now those costs may go up in, in the future as the uh, housing subsidies continue if uh, the usual care families stabilize without using housing and service interventions. Um, the benefits radiated beyond housing stability. Uh, there are fewer children separated from families, uh, fewer placed in foster care. Problems like substance abuse and domestic violence that can sometimes lead to homelessness were reduced by housing subsidies. Children had fewer school moves and the families were more food secure. Um, those last true were true for the temporary subsidies of rapid rehousing as well. Uh, so, uh, but you know, we don't have housing subsidies for everybody. Well, one thing we could do is to try to target those subsidies uh, more, more deeply. 
um, and your housing authorities were really helpful in doing this study and maybe they'd be willing to do more, uh, more targeting uh, here. Or more broadly, uh, I think the, the study points to the importance of housing affordability. And there are lots of levers that you can use for housing affordability. It's not just housing subsidies, whether temporary or long term. Um, and uh, Nan mentioned that uh, income inequality is more on the agenda. You know, raising the minimum wage would reduce the uh, uh, difference between what families can afford and what uh, the housing market costs them. Uh, helping families with employment programs, helping families with childcare. Remember, most of those families have very young children, and childcare. Uh, is equivalent to income and permits work effort. Uh, so there are lots of things that you can do to try to raise incomes. There are lots of things you can do uh, to try to make housing um, more affordable to the families. Inclusionary zoning, local trust funds, as well as the, the national one. 300 million works out to a little less than a dollar per person in the country. So it so sounds like a big, big number, but, it, but it's not. Um, and I think it's got to be all of the above. We need to think about all of these strategies to try to make housing uh, more affordable at the same time. And that involves a lot of people that aren't in this room as well as the, the people that are. At the same time that we're trying to make the homeless service system and the child welfare system more efficient and more collaborative. So thank you.